So I decided to call this series Best Batman Ever. That being the case, I feel like I shouldn't let another episode go by without addressing the Art Deco-inspired elephant in the room. Because while the premise of this series is that there are many, many very different, very awesome versions of Batman in different media created by different artists in different eras, the truth is, especially among fans in my age demographic, there's a consensus pick. And it's Batman the Animated Series. Now, those of you who are a lot younger than me might not remember, but before Batman the Animated Series came along in 1992, it was pretty slim pickings as far as cartoon superheroes, especially ones based on comic books. If you were a DC fan, you were pretty much stuck with Super Friends. And while I do have a soft spot for Super Friends, when I watch it today and take off the nostalgia glasses, I have to admit that it's pretty shoddy at least when judged by today's standards. It was no worse than anything else being produced in the 1970s or 80s, and when I was five, I sure didn't care about the animation quality. The last iteration of Super Friends, called the Super Powers Team Galactic Guardians, ended in 1985, so for, like, the entire second half of my childhood, there was no cartoon based on DC Comics characters. There was the Ruby Spears Superman cartoon that ran for 13 episodes in 1988, which I somehow completely missed the first time around and didn't discover until I was an adult. But after Super Friends ended, there was no animated Batman at all. Until 1992, that is, when Batman the Animated Series debuted. It's hard for me to describe to you the level of anticipation that was created during the lead-up to this show. That summer was probably the peak of my first really heavy phase of Batman fandom. I was 12 years old, I'd just seen and loved Batman Returns, I was the target audience for this new show, and I thought I knew what to expect. I figured it would be an animated take on the Tim Burton, Michael Keaton Batman movies since they were by far the most culturally dominant version of Batman at the time. As it turned out, that wouldn't last long. Batman the Animated Series debuted that September. I didn't know what was coming. I couldn't have. Not then, not at that age. Because Batman the Animated Series was so outside of my experience. When I finally got to watch it, it defied all of my expectations. Well, not all of them. It does draw some inspiration from the Tim Burton Batman films. The music by Shirley Walker and others, with the best-known opening theme composed by Danny Elfman, is obviously inspired by Elfman's scores for Batman and Batman Returns. The Joker's real name is established as Jack Napier, as in Burton's Batman. Selina Kyle is blonde, as is Michelle Pfeiffer's version of the character in Batman Returns. And there are other details here and there that are taken from the movies. Also, one of the primary references for the show's look, particularly the character designs, is the series of Superman animated shorts produced by the Fleischer Brothers in the 1940s. And by the time I was 12, I was very familiar with the Fleischer Brothers Superman. My grandparents had a tape of the Fleischer shorts, and I would watch it almost every time I came to visit. So while I didn't necessarily expect a Fleischer Brothers-inspired Batman cartoon in 1992, I at least recognized it when I saw it. But I'm getting ahead of myself a little. My point is, the debut of Batman the Animated Series was a watershed event that helped to create the inexhaustible torrent of superhero-related media we've seen for more than a generation now, particularly where animation is concerned. Before Batman the Animated Series, the field of superhero animation was sparsely planted and indifferently tended. Since Batman the Animated Series, superhero animation in the form of TV series, direct-to-video movies, various forms of streaming content, and theatrically released motion pictures has been more or less in continuous production. Almost seven years passed between the end of the final iteration of Super Friends and the debut of Batman the Animated Series. Seven years with no animated Batman at all, not as the star of his own series, not as a supporting character, nothing. Since Batman the Animated Series, there has been The New Batman Adventures, which is a redesigned continuation of Batman the Animated Series and usually considered part of the same series, Batman Beyond, Justice League and Justice League Unlimited, The Batman, 
Batman the Brave and the Bold, Young Justice, Beware the Batman, Justice League Action, and Harley Quinn, all of which either center on Batman or feature Batman as an important character. Plus, this past May, another animated series, Batman Cape Crusader, was announced to be produced by Bruce Timm, co-creator of Batman the Animated Series, set to debut on HBO Max next year. And that's not even counting the direct-to-video DC Universe animated movies that Warner Brothers Animation has been producing regularly since 2007, many of which feature Batman, and nearly two dozen of which are centered on Batman. In other words, if you're a Batman fan and you're young enough to not remember what it was like before 1992, let me assure you, it wasn't always like this. Batman the Animated Series changed everything. But why? What made this series so influential? What makes its Batman the definitive version of the character in the minds of so many fans? Maybe a good place to start is by looking at how it was different from other superhero cartoons that had come before. The most obvious difference is how the show looks. Before Batman the Animated Series, most superhero cartoons, most action-adventure cartoons generally speaking, looked alike. In Super Friends, for example, the character designs are basic, everyone looks like simplified versions of their comic book selves, the color palette is bright, the backgrounds are static and lacking in detail, there doesn't seem to have been much thought or effort put into creating an atmosphere or any particular aesthetic, the animation is minimal. Compare that to Batman the Animated Series. Look at these scenes from The Cat and the Claw Part 1, my first impression of the show, because it aired as the series premiere. Saturday morning, September 5th, 1992. The color palette is limited, the look is dark and moody, the backgrounds are stylishly painted, and I presume by now most people who have even a passing interest in the show know that the backgrounds were painted on black in order to achieve that dark look. The production design exists. Like, there's obvious thought put into everything. The gothic architecture of Gotham, the old-fashioned cars, the retro aesthetic that gives everything a cool, timeless feel. Those awesome Fleischer-inspired character designs, Batman with his curved ears and square jaw, built like a brick without the chiseled physique typical of the comics, Catwoman sleek and fast, Commissioner Gordon with his loose necktie, rumpled overcoat, and that hair. I have no idea what's going on with that, but it works. And the animation. Now, look, I don't want to oversell it. We're not talking about peak golden age of Disney or Fleischer Superman here or anything. But the animation quality is so far beyond what was seen on Saturday morning or weekday afternoon TV at the time or before that it's remarkable. Even compared to other standout superhero cartoons that were on at around the same time, the X-Men series that premiered the following month, the Spider-Man series that debuted two years later, Batman the Animated Series, is in a class by itself. The show's voice cast is another aspect that sets it apart and above other superhero cartoons. It's filled with recognizable names. Mark Hamill as the Joker, David Warner as Ra's al Ghul, Adrienne Barbeau as Catwoman. I could go on all day so I'll just go on for a little while longer. Richard Mull as Two-Face, John Glover as the Riddler, Michael Ansara as Mr. Freeze, Diana Muldar as Leslie Tompkins, Melissa Gilbert as Batgirl, Kate Mulgrew as Red Claw, Ed Asner as Roland Daggett, and that is definitely not all, but I'm going to stop there. Okay, one more. Roddy McDowell as the Mad Hatter. On paper, it's one of the most impressive casts any animated series has ever had. It's even more impressive when you consider that this show was being produced to air on Saturday mornings and weekday afternoons. But it's not just the names that are impressive. The performances are outstanding. Hamill's Joker is so definitive that he's kind of ruined the character for other actors. Other voice actors, anyway. I do think Heath Ledger manages to surpass him in live action in The Dark Knight. Hamill isn't the only voice actor to do justice to the Joker. Alan Tudyk is currently doing quite well with the character in the HBO Max Harley Quinn animated series, for example, but it's Hamill's Joker that will probably always be the benchmark, and deservedly so. Hamill's performance strikes just the right balance between funny and menacing. He sounds convincing whether he's snarling or yelling at the top of his lungs, and of course, he's got a maniacal laugh that is second to none. 
But what good is a top-notch Joker without a Batman to match him? Fortunately, Batman the Animated Series has that and then some. In a cast populated by well-known actors supported by voiceover veterans, the true master stroke of voice director Andrea Romano turned out to be casting a lead who was neither. Kevin Conroy, who plays Batman, is the great discovery of the series. He had a long list of television credits by 1992, guest spots, recurring roles, parts in failed pilots or short-lived series. He played Bart Falmont, the love interest of Stephen Carrington on Dynasty. But it's a lot more fun if you just imagine that character as a young Bruce Wayne, I'm just saying. He was an experienced actor, but he'd never done voice work. He was by no means a star, but he was hired to play Batman, and he wound up defining the character for an entire generation. Nice how that worked out. Conroy's Batman voice is a more robust variation of the low, raspy growl introduced by Michael Keaton in the movies. In Bruce Wayne mode, Conroy borrows a trick from Bud Collier, who voiced Superman on the radio in the 1940s and in the Fleischer shorts, and speaks in a bright, booming baritone, just as Collier did when performing the voice of Clark Kent. But unlike Keaton's Batman or Christian Bale's a decade and a half later, Conroy's performance makes it clear that his Batman voice is his character's natural speaking voice. It's the higher, jovial Bruce Wayne voice that is the affectation, the disguise. When Conroy's Batman speaks as Batman, he's speaking as his true self. Conroy is so good so immediately that when Adam West turns up to guest star in Beware the Grey Ghost, the 18th episode produced, which originally aired two months after the series premiere, it already feels not like stunt casting, but like the Batman of a previous generation appearing to pass the baton to the Batman of the next. Conroy owned the role just that fast. The generally high quality of the show's production design, animation, and performances didn't come about by accident. Running underneath every aspect of Batman the Animated Series is the obvious intention of its creators to make the best show they possibly could. The care, the attention to detail, the thought that went into producing this show is evident at every level. Even the writing, which is unquestionably the weakest point. Not saying there aren't well-written episodes. There are. I'm going to talk about some. Just that the quality of the writing isn't nearly as consistently high as other aspects of the show. But even so, it's still better than most of its contemporaries and nearly all of its predecessors, and whether or not it succeeds, an effort is clearly being made. The artists who made Batman the Animated Series, whatever their particular jobs, all seemed to genuinely care about making a good show. Unlike Super Friends or my personal favorite childhood cartoon, He-Man, they weren't making Batman the Animated Series to sell toys or just to fill half an hour in the broadcast schedule. They wanted to bring these characters to life, to tell stories, to express themselves, to make a show that had some artistic value that was entertaining and well-crafted, and occasionally even had something to say. In all of these ways, it raised the bar and set a new standard for television animation. It also reinvented the character of Batman and his world in a way that was both appealing to longtime fans and accessible to new ones, a feat to which all comic book adaptations before and since have aspired, and only a few have accomplished as successfully. Batman the Animated Series makes it look easy. One of the keys to this throughout the run of the series is in the carefully constructed status quo, which has some important elements of the Batman mythos already in place, with others yet to be established. As the series begins, Batman has been active for quite a while. Robin, Dick Grayson, but with a costume design similar to the one worn by Tim Drake in the comics at the time, is attending college. And certain members of the rogues gallery, like the Joker and the Penguin, are depicted as having been adversaries of Batman for some time. But Harvey Dent is not yet Two-Face, Pamela Isley hasn't begun her criminal career as Poison Ivy quite yet, and Batman and Robin haven't met Mr. Freeze, Clayface, the Riddler, or Ra's al Ghul. The series gets a lot of mileage out of introducing us to its versions of classic characters. Its most critically acclaimed episode, Heart of Ice, depicts Batman's first meeting with Mr. Freeze. 
in the comics, one of several interchangeable supervillains with cold-themed gimmicks, who in this version is reimagined as a tragic figure who commits his crimes to take vengeance against the company he blames for the death of his terminally ill wife. Heart of Ice is a high point of the series, especially in terms of writing. Heart of Ice won a Daytime Emmy for outstanding writing in an animated program, beating out fellow nominees Tiny Toon Adventures and Goof Troop, just to give you a sense of the overall landscape in which the show was situated. The two-parters depicting Harvey Dent's transformation into Two-Face and Matt Hagen becoming Clayface our series high points as well, and also emphasize the tragic qualities of the villains. While the series lifted certain elements directly from specific eras of the Batman comics, it draws particular inspiration from the brief run on Detective Comics by Steve Englehart and Marshall Rogers in the late 1970s, which I mentioned in the first video in this series. Most of the episodes are original stories. Two notable exceptions to this are the two-parter which introduces Ra's al Ghul, The Demon's Quest, which is based on the comics by Denny O'Neill and Neil Adams with a teleplay written by O'Neill, and The Laughing Fish, which is adapted from the most well-known story from the Englehart Rogers run. Through its combination of reinterpretation and direct adaptation, the series is able to create a version of the Batman mythos that is simultaneously universal and uniquely its own. In place of the decades of history and the variations in tone and art style of the comics, it has a streamlined continuity and a style that evokes the earliest comics but doesn't feel bound to any particular era. At its best, it feels like a distilled, purified form of Batman, not just definitive, but fundamental. So fundamental that it now serves as an inspiration to the comic books it originally drew inspiration from. The series introduced Harley Quinn, who soon became one of its most popular characters, was eventually written into the mainstream DC Comics continuity, given her own monthly comic book, and subsequently adapted into the live-action DC Extended Universe movies, where she's played by Margot Robbie and is one of the consistent bright spots of that extremely inconsistent franchise. The animated series defined or redefined what Batman is for millions of fans, and it's not a narrow definition. It's broad enough to allow the series to dabble in a variety of genres that Batman has visited in the comics over the years. Action adventure, crime fiction, noir, horror, sci-fi, even a few ill-advised attempts at comedy. Not every episode is a masterpiece. As I've said, the writing in the show goes through some fairly steep ups and downs. There are many forgettable episodes. Is Tiger Tiger anyone's favorite episode? Or The Forgotten? Hey, what an appropriate title. And there are a handful of episodes like Holiday Nights and Critters from the new Batman Adventures run that are embarrassingly bad. Also, I've never liked the animated series version of Bane. Henry Silva does a great job providing the voice, but the rest of the character, from the design to the writing, isn't nearly as impressive. And he especially suffers in comparison to his counterpart in the comics, which isn't the case for most of the other prominent members of the rogues gallery. But those low points are outweighed and then some by the series' many triumphs. Episodes I've already mentioned, like Heart of Ice and The Demon's Quest, other standouts like Robin's Reckoning and Perchance to Dream, and my personal favorite, Baby Doll, which features an impressively complex original villain. The overall quality of the series was so high that Fox actually aired several episodes in prime time during its first year, which is extremely rare for a show originally produced to be watched by children on Saturday mornings and weekdays after school. And its second year, it got a theatrically released feature film, Batman Mask of the Phantasm, which came out on Christmas of 1993. My grandmother took me to see it. No, 13 isn't too old to be going to see movies with your granny, as a matter of fact, so why don't you back off, huh? Mask of the Phantasm didn't make much of a splash at the time, but it's since become a fan favorite. There are quite a few folks who consider it the best Batman movie Period. Live action, animation, theatrical, direct-to-video, streaming, whatever. I am not one of them. I don't think Mask of the Phantasm is better than The Dark Knight, or is even the best movie to be spun off of the animated series. For me, that title goes to Batman and Mr. Freeze Sub-Zero, which was released direct-to-home video in 1998. But 
That doesn't mean Mask of the Phantasm is bad. Quite the contrary. And I can tell you from firsthand experience, getting to see the animated series version of Batman on the big screen was pretty amazing. Primetime network broadcasts and theatrically released films aren't treatments that are usually given to children's superhero cartoons, and they were even more uncommon in the early 1990s. But when you're watching Batman the Animated Series, particularly if it's one of the best episodes, you get it. The series looks great. It manages to reduce decades of comic book lore into something trim and accessible. It tells some terrific stories. And at the center of it all, it shows us a Batman who is grim, somber, fairly serious in keeping with the general tone of the character in the movies and the comics at the time, but is never bleak or angst-ridden. The animated Batman has the same backstory as every other version of the character. His parents were murdered before his eyes when he was a child, and that tragedy has shaped him, motivated him. But his character is defined more by his heroism and his desire to be a force for good than by grief or pain or a compulsion to seek revenge for the deaths of his parents. It's dark, but not excessively dark, and it doesn't mistake darkness for depth. He's a well-balanced, sturdy Batman. He's not everyone's favorite Batman, he's not mine, but he's the Batman everyone can agree on. Snot-nosed little punk kids who've never even thought about Batman, cynical superfans who've thought about him way too much, just normal people, everyone. I'm guessing most of you watching this video are already familiar with the animated series, but if you're not, check it out. After a few episodes, I think you'll understand why so many consider it the best Batman ever.